Hey everybody, we're back for another edition of the podcast. I'm David Allen. It's probably been a while if you're listening to this. I won't get into that right away, but today we got an exciting guest who's going to talk a lot about social media. His name is Scott Ayers. He's from the Social Media Lab and the parent company Agora Pulse. Scott, welcome to the show. Hey, thanks for uh, having me on. Yeah, I think this is going to be exciting because uh, as people will find out uh, in short order, it's been a little hiatus here for the uh, email marketing podcast and we're getting back at her and uh, you're the first guest to sort of uh, uh, restart things post summer. And so maybe let's uh, give a little of your backstory. How did you get into social media and sort of, you know, take us, take us up to where you're at now? Man, it depends on where we start. Uh, <laughs> I think when, when social media first came out back in the old MySpace days, I was addicted to MySpace. Um, and then from a business perspective, you know, I, I guess this was probably, I don't know, 2007, 2008. I started working in the uh, auto transport business. I moved cars for a living, uh, mainly like people who bought and sold cars on eBay or auctions and stuff. And a guy named Gary Remy, who I still remember, was in, I lived in Houston at the time. He came in our office and was hoping it was the SEO and stuff. And he's like, Hey, you guys got to sign up for this site called LinkedIn. And uh, we're like, what is that? And he's like, sign up for it. And you're gonna get tons of customers from it. You just got to connect with people. And so I, I signed up for LinkedIn and sure enough, I got addicted to it. I went, this is so cool. Cause I, for one, I can talk to people and I can get a lot of business from it. I saw the business value of it. Um, and then fast forward about a year and a half and I started my own transport business uh, from home, you know, shipping cars, you know, instead of having to split commissions, kept it all myself, but got all the headaches. So, um, and so I dove in completely with Facebook and Twitter um, because nobody in that niche was really doing much in that and uh, discovered that I, I could get more than 50% of my clients uh, via Twitter and Facebook and not to spend any money on that. I was just connecting with people. Um, and through that process, the fun thing was, and how I kind of moved over from the transport business into this, um, I, I started creating, there was a product called Fan Page Engine back in those days that was, um, if you're familiar with Facebook pages, they used to be able to do those custom tabs, they called them. Um, they had this product that was real simple, uh, didn't need, require any coding. You could create these customized pages for people to have on their business page. So I started using their tool to make my own pages on my, my Facebook page and then started selling them, like doing the service for people and started doing blogs and, and videos and tutorials about how to use their product. And the guy, David Foster, who owned the company, he reached out to me. He's like, man, you know more about our app than we do. And uh, he said, can you write some blogs for us? Or, and then can you do some training videos for us? So for a couple of months, I started doing training videos for him and blogs for him. And then he's like, hey, you want to help out with customer support? I'm like, yeah, sure. Why not? You know, I'm doing this on the side during the run of my shipping business right. and then the, econ the economy collapsed. Um, and that's when, that's when fuel prices went to like, I'm in Texas. And so for us, normal fuel price was like $2 a gallon, went to like four and a half, five dollars a gallon. Um, and no one was buying cars for one and nobody could get them shipped either. And so it, right about that time, you know, Dave was like, Hey, why don't you come work for me full time? And, uh, so I'm like, sure. I didn't know what that meant. I've been the typical, you know, having nine to five kind of you know job. And uh, for all my life. And, and, and so I started doing social media for them and started being their guy to blog. And then within a couple of about a year or so, our blog went to the top 10 list for social media examiners, top social media blogs, which was a big deal. Um, and so through that process, I worked for them for a couple of years. And then I worked for another app company called Post Planner, um, doing the same sort of work, you know, the, the blogging, the, I must have written 2000 blogs for them. Um, I got to co-author Facebook all in one for dummies uh, through that process and got our blog at the top of social media examiners list again. And then about a year and a half ago or so, January, 2017, I came on board at Agora Pulse um, just to do this project we call the social media lab. Right. It's pretty interesting. Yeah. I and mean, I could go even further about what I've done before that, which would blow your mind, but uh, <laughs> for this, we'll leave it at that. Yeah. <laughs> So Former is, minister turned social media. Oh geek. wow, wow, uh, that's very interesting. So that so this is where where you're at now. You came on board with Agora Pulse, and you got the social media lab. And this is the concept. I, I get questions uh, being in marketing. I get questions about social media all the time, and I don't really consider myself even that well qualified to answer uh, some of them beyond my uh, rare few exploits on my own. Maybe you start talking about. What should people be doing? I mean, it's, it's a constantly, it seems like a constantly shifting 
sand, you know, of like what's hot, what's what's not, and the different uh, algorithms are changing constantly, of course. And you know, what what should people be doing if, you're, if they're if this is a small business owner listening to this right now? Where should they start, and what, what sort of sh- stuff should they be looking to do? Um, well, that's that's a convoluted question, right? Uh, <laughs> there's a lot to that. <laughs> there's a lot to that apple to bite into. Um, you know, for one, for what we do at the lab, <clears throat> just to kind of throw it out there, we, you know, our goal is to, is to go out there and, and test all the different social media tactics that we hear from a lot of the gurus, uh, a lot of brands that are trying, or just people questioning, wondering if this works or not. We can't test everything. There's some things that you can't quantify and get good data on. So right. we, don't, we don't bother testing. Though. A lot of stuff on based on sentiment are real hard to test. Right. Uh, but I can go out there and run a test like I just published a test today uh, on LinkedIn hashtags. Um, do, does, does using a hashtag, at least one on a LinkedIn post, get you more impressions? And, and our results came back. Yes, they do. Compared to the same exact link post, they got about 29% higher impressions. Uh, when we add at least nice. one hashtag to it, which tells me people are using hashtags on LinkedIn. Right. Um, and so there's stuff like that we can test that are, that are pretty, I wouldn't say easy. They're very time consuming. Like right now I'm working on a test on Twitter on about five different Twitter accounts. It's, it's, it's going to end up being about 1500 tweets um, that I've got to schedule and go through. And so the process sometimes is daunting. Um, but our, our whole goal is just to try to figure out ways to, you know, bust those myths and, and talk about those things that people are, are saying is true and sometimes they're not. And then given data to back it up and try to pull out opinion as much as I can, which is really hard for an opinionated person like myself. But um, I try to pull it out on all the blog posts where we want to say, this is the data. And sometimes we're shocked by it. And sometimes I'm absolutely wrong on my hypothesis. Right. Uh, and I have to kind of, you know, eat crow and say, well, that didn't work. Um, but, and this <laughs> did. And here's the data and the science says that. And, I think that's the better way for a small business to go back to your, your first, your question. You know, I, I think for one, you, you've got to figure out, and this isn't something, you know, I've tested cause it'd be hard to test cause your business is going to be different, but you need to figure out where your audience is. Um, if your audience is not an Instagram audience, don't be on Instagram. Um, if they're not a Twitter audience, don't be there. If they're not a Facebook audience, don't be there. Heck your audience might be on Google plus still who knows. Um, and so you've got to find out what that is for you. I think most businesses feel the, uh, the obligation to hop on every social platform there is and they run themselves ragged trying to keep up and they end up doing a poor job with all of them instead of just being really good at one of them. Um, so that's the first thing I would say. And you would test that probably by doing zip. If you're a local business, do a zip code search on the different sites, see how many users are in that area or try to run an ad on one of those sites and see what kind of target market you get when you do your, whatever your perfect target market looks like. Um, that's how you're going to know if it's the right platform to you. Um, so you want to look at that. And then, you know, from there, it's just, it's trying different things to see what works, what kind of, what sort of content resonates uh, with your brand. It's not going to be the same for every brand. Um, like for example, I, for the last five years, uh, I had a side business running, doing it, written bounce houses and water slides and stuff. Oh, cool. And, cool. My, and in Texas. Yeah. Yeah. My nieces parent, love you, by the way. <laughs> yeah. As a parent of three, it was like an easy thing to go do. Cause I was renting them anyway. Right. So I was like I might as well do this as a side gig, but it was kind of funny through, through that process. I did, it, I did it for five years. I actually just passed the business over three weeks ago to my brother. He's been working with me the entire five years and it made sense to finally just move on from it and let him run it. Um, and, and so it, I noticed through that though, that, you know, there were certain things on social media that worked for me that didn't work on other sites. Like for example, on, on that bounce house business, posting links to my product was horrible. No one cared. No one clicked on them. You know, I didn't get any right. traffic, any engagement, but boy, I post a picture of some kid smiling on a water slide. The thing would Gold. go viral in my local Gold. area. <laughs> yeah. But I do the opposite for like an Agora Pulse, which is a SaaS company. It's, you know, it's software. Right. The links are, are do great for us. Photos are just kind of meh sometimes, you know, on Facebook, you know, people are like, well, okay, great. Yeah. You posted a photo of your team. Good for you. But <laughs> you know, it, it's not, it's not as, there's not that as close of a connection yeah, for right. a bigger, for a company like that. Um, so you got to figure out what that is for you. Um, and then kind of run with it from there. Like Instagram, for example, uh, and we can get into some data stuff here in a second, but on Instagram for that local bounce house business, I even though I had 5,000 or so followers on this account, I worked really hard on it for five years. I didn't get any business from it at all. 
I mean, it's just, right. I got, I got some, you know, vanity metric likes, you know, and some, you know, ancillary type engagement, but no one was, you know, messaging me or calling me from Instagram saying I want to rent a bounce house, but about 80% of my business, and we did six figures a year, 80% of our business was coming from Facebook. And so the rest of it was Google. And so I went, when I passed the business on to my brother the other day, I'm like, for one, you're not, I, I'll give you the Facebook page, which had, you know, six, 7,000 likes. And I spent a lot of money to get to that on a, on a small town. It's only 8,000 people to get that many likes. Um, I said, yeah, I'm not giving you the Instagram account though, for one, because it's a waste of your time. And two, I want to use it for something else. So, <laughs> so I stole it and changed the name to something else so I could continue to use it for testing. Um, so yeah, that was a, a, a fun little experiment. So that, that whole thing for me has been an experiment the entire five years to kind of see what works, what doesn't work. Um, what I've found for a, for a local business, I don't know if mainly your listeners are local businesses or are small businesses or what, um, I, I'm finding that, that Facebook live is, is gold for a local business. Um, and, and a real prime real life example. Uh, and I talk about this guy all the time, a friend of mine named Gerald owns a pizza joint in my town. And, uh, he, he created this, 28 inch around pizza called the Colossus, uh, giant pizzas. I could literally, great. literally the, literally <laughs> the box barely fit in the back of my suburban. That shows you how big it is. Um, and so he created the same, <laughs> make me hungry, like, Scott. <laughs> I know exactly. And it's about seven pounds just with pepperoni and cheese on it, seven pounds. And, uh, he said, uh, he wanted to do an eating contest and see if somebody could eat that pizza in an hour. And if they did, they got the pizza for free. They got a t-shirt, they got their you know, picture on the wall, blah, blah, blah. And the pizza is about 60 bucks. And, uh, and so I'm like, Gerald, dude, you, you got to go, you got to go live on Facebook. And he's like, I don't know how to do that. I mean, he, he's a guy that is annoyed with Facebook, you know, cause he doesn't want to pay for ads and all this stuff. Sure. And I'm like, I'm like, you've got to run a Facebook live. So I'm literally like 30 minutes before this starts, I'm texting him how to go live on Facebook. And uh, so he hops on his phone, goes live on Facebook and, for, and his page has got about 2,200 likes to kind of put it in perspective. And uh, he'll get, he'll get decent engagement, you know, 30, 40 likes on posts, that sort of thing. And uh, <laughs> in the first 10 minutes, maybe 50 or 60 of us were watching it. I was watching from home because it was like seven, eight o'clock at night. And uh, all of a sudden, after about that 15, 20 minute mark, you know, there was a hundred people, there's 200 people, 300 people, 400, all of a sudden it jumped wow. to like a thousand, two thousand. I think the max live was about 2,500 people watching it. Wow. And they were watching it from around the globe. It wasn't just locally. There was people from France, from, from Ireland, from the UK, all around the United States watching this guy and this little podunk town in Texas try to eat this giant pizza. Uh, so the right people saw it and somehow Facebook's algorithm saw that and noticed, hey, this is trending. This is hot. And so they started showing it to more people. Wow. And, and uh, the cool part of the guy didn't eat the pizza. He, he ran off camera with like a minute left and, you know, vomited, I think. Um, and, and luckily that wasn't on camera. And Gerald's phone died, you know, right after that. He was texting me later like, this was awesome. The, the video got about, I think, total about 12,000 views, uh, which was massive for, for a little brand like that. But where's the ROI in that? Yeah, it's great that, you know, people watched it. The next day, the local news station contacted him and said, hey, can we send out one of our reporters and do a live remote during our morning show for two hours and let him try to eat that pizza? Massive free advertising. That's amazing. I mean, massive free advertising for him. The guy, and of course, he, got, he ate less of the pizza in the hour. Uh, right. former, former football player, and he couldn't, he couldn't eat hardly any of it. But the thing I told Gerald, Mike, you got it. He, now he keeps doing them. He does those lives every time. He doesn't get 10,000, 12,000 views every time, but he's getting a couple hundred, a couple thousand. And it's kind of created this, you know, momentum for him now that he sells that pizza like crazy. And it all started because he, he did that Facebook live. He pushed the button, went live, didn't know what he was doing. Didn't cost him a single penny, you know, to do it. And, and now he's seeing, you know, huge dividends on doing that one little act. Um, so that's, I mean, I haven't, that's not even a test on the lab, but that's just a little, a little personal right. thing that I've seen, you know, real life happen. And I went, golly, I wish we could test. I'm pulling his data actually to look at it and see what it's done to his page since then. But, um, cause I am actually an admin on his page now. I said, you gotta make me an admin on your page so I can look at it. Um, so what should maybe you do? Um, well, let's talk about Instagram if you don't mind. Uh, oh, I'd like, I'd like to talk about Instagram cause I have another business, uh, myself and, uh, I use Instagram. I've tried to 
start my page and and, and the just the, or I had a page, but I tried to like you know uh, put some work into it here the last yeah. over the summer. And I'd love to hear more about Instagram, as I'm sure people would, because it seems hot right now. It is, you know, and it's one of those things where you know the the avid user, the typical user on Instagram, has been younger, or people who just want to post, you know their coffee and their lunch and, you know, activities and all that stuff. Um, but there's tons of stuff on the business perspective that, that, you know, are huge value. Instagram stories are awesome. Uh, especially if you got your audience as millennials, you want to leverage stories like crazy, but some things that we tested that, you know, all the quote unquote gurus have been teaching were, were pretty interesting. First one, um, that was probably the biggest one that I had to bust and I really was scared to publish this <laughs> when it all got done um, because a lot of my friends in marketing have been teaching this for years. Um, and I even reached out to them and said, Hey, just so you know, <laughs> I'm, I've tested this and I, you know, this isn't working. Um, and so what, what, what a lot of marketers have been teaching a lot of people over the years is when you use hashtags, put them in the first comment instead of leaving them in the post because it makes the, the original post look kind of ugly you know, because you've got too much text and people don't want to see the hashtags. They know you're being, you know, Mr. Spammy marketer by using the hashtags. Um, so they, you know, people have been struck people for years to kind of hide those in the comments, hide those in the comments. And there's even apps out there that, you know, circumvent Instagram's official API and will put the first comment in for you, even though they're, they're breaking Instagram's API by doing it. Right. Um, and so a lot of people have been doing it for years. I used to do it. I, I'd always go back and put it in the comments because, you know, you want it to look pretty in a sense, you know, for to users. And so we tested 30 hashtags, you know, in the original post and then the same 30 hashtags in the comments, you know, on different posts to kind of see which one, you know, might do better uh, in the end. And here's the interesting, here's the, here's the data. Um, likes were 9.84% higher when we put the hashtags in the original post. So right there alone, the engagement was higher when I just left them in the post. And then the, here's the more important part I thought, reach or impressions or however you want to call it on Instagram was 29.41% higher when we just simply put the hashtags in the original post instead of going back and putting it in the comments. Wow. 29 I feel good, I feel good then. Yeah, 29% is massive. It had just been like 8%. percent i have been like, well, you know, that's almost a wash. But 29% is a big deal. Uh, and, and so, I mean, I went back and tested it twice just to make sure because, I mean, I literally, I won't name their names, but there was a couple of people I'm like, God, oh, these influencers are going to be ticked off at us uh, because they're friends of ours but they, and they have courses on this stuff. And I'm like, eh, okay. But it, it's – <laughs> yeah, it's true. And you got to go with the data on anything in life. You got to go by what the data says, not your opinion on it. Um, and, and so what, what happens here, and the reason this became a thing is, is a couple of reasons. It used to be you saw a lot more of the text when you're thumbing through Instagram on your phone. Right. Now you'd only see about three lines and then it goes to the dot, dot, dot more and you have to tap on the more to open up the rest of the post. So you don't see the ugly block of someone's text because Instagram right. doesn't want that user experience. They want you to focus on the photo, not necessarily the text. So that's changed for one. So if you put it far enough down below the fold, if you will, you know, no one will see it anyway. The second thing was, you know, you rewind a couple of years ago, Instagram's algorithm, you know, on the explore option with the hashtags, if you, if you did, whenever you put your hashtag in is it would show back up at the top of that explore option. So if, if I posted something, you know, right now and then, let's say 30, 40 minutes, an hour, two hours. I don't know what the time would have been. You know, later I come back in and post a bunch of hashtags in the comments. Boom. That post gets surfaced back to the top of the Explorer option for that hashtag. Uh, ah. Immediately. That doesn't, Instagram realizes it's like every other social yeah. platform. They realize that marketers like me have, you know, trying or getting around their algorithm and they said, Oh, wait a minute, let's not do that anymore. So now it, it, that Explore option on your, on Instagram, is based on the time the post was made. And so it doesn't matter when you put that hashtag in, it's not going to push it back up to the top like it used to. So it's, it's when you put that post in. So you want to get it out there as soon as you can and then and make sure it shows up in that explore option that someone's searching for, you know, pizzas in Dallas or something. I don't know. Right. Um, <laughs> it, it'll show up where it's, now I got pizza on the brain. Uh, <laughs> it's all it, thanks to you. Right. Um, <laughs> I say that with my Chick-fil-A sitting next to me. Uh, 
and so, and so, I mean, that, that's how that Explore feed is working now. And I think that's why we saw the results we did because they're, they're in a sense, you're penalized if you try to go back and do it later because you're getting around the algorithm. You're, you're working around it or trying to. So now you're not rewarded for that. Um, the other thing to think about too with hashtags, and, this, and we've done a lot of tests on hashtags because it's such a, people know they're good, but they don't know what to do with them a lot of times. Um, hashtags are not for your existing followers. So it doesn't matter if you use right. them for them. The, your, your existing followers are going to see your content based on if they've engaged with you before or not. Uh, so if they're engaging with you, it doesn't matter what the content part of it says. The hashtag is not going to resurface it for them. The hashtags or on any of the sites, where it's LinkedIn, Facebook, Twitter, whatever, hashtags are for people searching with that hashtag to hopefully find your content and get exposed to it. Maybe come like you, follow you, whatever. Um, so you got to kind of keep that in mind with the hashtags and, and your strategy on them. So, you know, the whimsical ones are funny maybe, but they don't do any good. Um, you know, hashtag right. that was fun. Well, who cares? No one's searching. That was fun. <laughs> hashtag. Um, they're searching, you know, social media, SAS, tech, marketing tips, you know, they're searching for that sort of stuff, you know, motivational, whatever it might be. Um, they're searching those hashtags. So that's what those hashtags are for. Um, and so you got to use those, right? So that was a big one on Instagram that, I mean, I tell you what, I got so many, I got a couple of emails going, are you sure? I'm like, yeah, I, I wish it was different, but it's not, but it makes it interesting. Uh, <laughs> well, that's, so that's the important part though. I mean that like, as people listen to this podcast, a lot of people are, are freelance copywriters and, and the people who employ freelance copywriters and, you know, in the direct response world, this is exactly the important part is what you guys are doing. Yeah. Media is like, we want to know not what we think works. We want to know what actually works. Yeah. And but you can only get that through testing. Exactly. And if, and if you're not testing, you know, you're just, you're taking the advice and it's just advice from someone else who, who maybe it worked for them, but it, 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 it's not going to work for everybody. So that's why it's, what's been really cool with this project is, and I call it project. It's my full-time job, so it's not going away. But <laughs> with the lab, the, the cool, the cool part of it, oh, that's for my boss. The way he doesn't say, "Oh, I can get." Rid of <laughs> He's like, "Why was he on that podcast?" <laughs> yeah, right. Um, but the the thing with the, the lab that you know, we, we try to do is not just test on you know a, a software company's page. We're testing on a bounce house business. We're testing on a personal profile. We're we're testing on you know, a pizza business or, you know, someone who's selling digital products. We're testing on multiple kinds of accounts and then averaging those numbers together. They kind of give us a trend. Um, otherwise right. what happens in a lot of those tests is, is that I've seen what other people do, you know, let's, and I'm not picking on anybody. I'm just saying like, let's say HubSpot by your users, pretty listeners probably know HubSpot. Yeah. Um, let's say they run a test on just their account and they get some really cool data. Maybe it's, you know, hundreds of pieces of data but it was only on their type of business. So unless you, you are that sort of, you know, uh, inbound marketing type company, it may not apply to you. Uh, right. And so that's real important to kind of, for me to always have that cross section of different types. Um, that way I can give an average uh, and then kind of go from use that average for my conclusion. So uh, that, that's, that's a really big deal for me. So tell people, you know, as we wind down here, uh, tell people how to get a hold of you and like maybe, you know, where to go to listen to the social media lab and hear some more of this fantastic data that you are uh, accumulating. Yeah. Anywhere you listen to podcasts, just search for social media lab. You should find us. Um, we're, we're on all the different, you know, podcast platforms. As far as our website, you can go to agorapulse.com forward slash social media lab. We kind of decided in the beginning not to do a, a separate brand with it because for us, the social media lab is all about, you know, getting out some great content and um, busting somebody's myths, but it's also a branding move for us. And right, for right. Adorable. So we kind of, I, I, word, I, I kind of equated to, we get a room in the house, um, <laughs> nice. a small room on the house on Agora Pulse. So agorapulse.com forward slash social media lab. You can see all the different experiments based on the topics. You can go directly to the podcast from there. Um, and anywhere on social, we're basically at Agora Pulse. Um, and if you tweet us, it's always me pretty much that <laughs> does offer social media because I'm also our social media manager. Awesome. Uh, so that, that's usually me that's engaging. And if anybody has, you know, some sort of dying question or something they'd love to see tested, we're always open to taking, you know, um, ideas from people. And if we run with one of them, we'll always mention you in that test or have you do it along with us. That's excellent. Excellent. I think you've given out 
just pounds of uh, valuable uh, content and you've busted some, uh, you know, uh, some myths that have been perpetuating this industry for a, a long time, which I really enjoyed. And it's been a real pleasure having you on, Scott. Thanks for coming on the show, man. Yeah, th thanks for having me on. And uh, it was good talking to you. We'll have to circle back. You know, maybe you've got something you want me to test and we'll circle back on it. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, for everybody else, listen to this. And, you know, welcome to the Email Marketing Podcast, which is uh, we're kickstarted again after the, a lazy summer, so to speak. And uh, we'll be back again with another exciting guest. Hopefully someone is insightful and as uh, scientifically driven as Scott. <laughs>